Hello, welcome to this last cost webinar in our series, Ukraine War and the EU. And today we welcome Aurel Costa. He is an associate researcher at the IBIE, so that's not so easy, Institute Barcelona Estudis Internacionals. Yes from um, Barcelona and he's also associate professor of international, international relations at the University of Autonoma of Barcelona. Uh, he coordinates a BA degree in international relations and this is his home, international relations. His research looks at the interaction between the European Union and international institutions and he's especially interested how the international institutions shape the ways in which the EU acts in the international arena. He also does research on international environmental policy and he has published a wide, in wide range on many topics and in very prestigious uh, publishing houses and in very prestigious journals. Uh, I will not list them all because then it will, it will take too much time. I'm very happy to have you here, Ariel, and you're talking uh, today about the strategic autonomy. So how is it with the strategic autonomy of the EU? Please go ahead. Okay, so um, the, um, the purpose of, of this presentation is to make some uh, sense of the impact of the war in Ukraine on EU foreign uh, policy, particularly in, in terms of the goal of attaining a larger degree of a strategic uh, autonomy. And I, and I think there's really no need for me to justify the relevance and timeliness of the topic. But at the same time, and, and probably for the same reasons of relevance and timeliness, there are two concerns that have been bothering me when preparing my notes for today. As, as regards the war in Ukraine, the, the risk of being too focused on the present. That's the first concern, too short-sighted, too ready to claim that this changes everything. And as regards strategic autonomy, the risk of taking the terms used by actors uh, themselves at face value and use them as analytical categories, right? So I will try to steer away from these two traps and still remain attentive to the need to, as it were, think in real time in a scholarly acceptable fashion. Okay, so in the process, I hope to outline what could be the embryo of a research agenda that together with the several we are trying to put together as a paper for the next uh, ASAPEC conference in Athens. In that spirit, I begin with a puzzle, a, a multi-level puzzle, if you wish. We have on the one hand, the idea the EU has taken steps forward, really remarkable steps forward on, on on CFSP matters and on security and defense matters, right? In the fields of joint procurement, um, industry, um, even the military aid to Ukraine, of course, right? So joint procurement, uh, uh, industrial capacities, all this has taken uh, really remarkable steps forward. Yet it has been said that precisely because of the war, um, strategic autonomy has become or remains even more so than before a pipe dream. I'm, I'm quoting here from uh, think tank papers and, 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 and journals. Uh, Germany, if we look not at the level of the EU, but the level of um, big member states, uh, of course, has taken this uh, Zeitenbender, right? This uh, historical change. Um, but nevertheless has been seen as a reluctant giant, right? Because of, in account of its qualms in, in, in uh, sending heavy weaponry to, 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 Germ to, to Ukraine <clears throat> and other, you know, uh, um, more lukewarm as compared to the UK, for instance, uh, more lukewarm uh, behaviors vis-a-vis -vis the war in Ukraine. And then France, of course, you know, you, you could think that these times are propitious for, the French discourse on European sovereignty, but France for sure has managed to alienate half of the EU, right? The Eastern half of the EU uh, when, when, when talking about, about the war and what should be done to move, uh, to move uh, forward. So there's this puzzle here, right? Um, I think that we need to appreciate to what an extent we cannot explain this puzzle away 
by relying on us on our, on, on, on our usual topoi, right? This is not a case of the proverbial capability expectations gap, right? Uh, policy changes have defined expectations here, actually, right? So there's no capability expectations gap. Um, these are really uh, remarkable step, uh, step forwards. And nevertheless, right, there's this, there's this uh, paradox. Uh, this is also not a matter of uh, your average failing forward dynamic, right? This is not some sort of suboptimal intergovernmental agreement that then creates new, new functional dynamics that leads that lead to new crises demanding new suboptimal intergovernmental agreements. This is not what we find here. This is not an internally driven process or, or not only an internally driven uh, uh, process. So let me present our hypothesis up front here. Um, the hypothesis basically claims that the goalposts for the EU to be an actor are moving. And who or what is doing the moving? Well, the, the war in Ukraine is as, as part of a longer chain of events that have accelerated the fragmentation of the liberal international order uh, recently. Uh, such fragmentation is making the international system less propitious, I would say much less propitious for the EU and it's making the requirements for actorness for the EU to be an actor uh, more, more demanding. Implicit in this claim is an understanding of actorness that pays close attention to the factors that belong to, not within the EU, but that belong to the international system at large. To be sure, the most canonical analysis of actorness have already included variables that, that are external to the EU, right? Uh, for instance, uh, Bretherton and Vogler uh, talk about presence, capability, and opportunity, and of course, opportunity is externally shaped, right? And um, Upil and Caporasso, for instance, they talk about recognition, authority, autonomy, and cohesion, and of course, recognition depends by others, right? Uh, depends upon others, so it is also externally uh, given. <clears throat> they do not see the capacity of the EU to be an actor as dependent only on internal variables, right? But nevertheless, that's where most of their emphasis has been located, on the internal side of determinants for actorness. Right? And in addition, the most usual open operationalizations of uh, external factors have been either rather vague and, and general and hard to operationalize, right? Uh, Bratherton and Bogler say, already they said that in, in 2013, that the EU was an actor past its speak, right? Um, EU actorness had already passed its peak because of uh, a, closing, a closing opportunity structure, right? Or then it is uh, super specific, right? Like issue complexity, right? Really, really issue specific factors, issue specific external factors. Right? <clears throat> I think that that this is this made sense for 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 a long time, right? This is probably due to the scholarly practice of looking for variation, right? Uh, during and, and during many years, the basic conditions of the international order, uh, which we characterize as a liberal international order, could be taken as broadly constant, and most of the variation took place across issue areas, right? So so it, it was it. It made sense that they approached it in, in, in this way. But I think that this might not hold anymore. There are processes in place that have led to the fragmentation of the liberal international order. And to simplify, these are a return of great power competition that has led to, uh, to this crisis of the international order. And then the weaponization of interdependence and a more multipolar structure that, that are leading to a Kindleberger um, crisis of the international order. And, and, and they combine in, in ways that make this external world in which the EU act much more fluid than it used to be, right? Um, now, uh, this fragmentation of the liberal international order, and that's where the Ukraine war uh, plays a role as well, has been greatly accelerated by a number of events each of which has been perceived as stunning in itself, right? The election of Trump, which led to trade wars and transactionalism, uh, of course, the, the pandemic, and, and now the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. This have all, all been perceived as 
great accelerators of the experimentation of the liberal international order, which was already into play as shown by the fact that Brother Donald Vogler already in 2013 said the U is past its peak, right? Uh, all of these, all of these uh, crises or all of these factors, sorry, <clears throat> have in different ways pushed both the Kindleberger and to see this aspects of, of the current state of international politics. And, and on the whole, we think that we should actually be expecting such changes to have a huge impact on the EU. This would have mattered for any actor, but the EU was made by the liberal international order. The EU was made under particular conditions. The EU and particularly EU actorness internationally, the role of the EU as an international actor uh, was a product of one particular set of international conditions that are now withering away, sometimes at great speed. So how does the fragmentation of the liberal international order, including the war in Ukraine, impact EU actorness more specifically? We propose that there are three mechanisms uh, perhaps there are more, but we identify three mechanisms. First, it shifts the foreign policy agenda towards issues over which there is a lower level of agreement in the EU. It also shifts the foreign policy agenda towards issues over which the EU has been granted less authority by member states, and in which decision uh, make, uh, making processes are uh, more uh, complicated, and also issues over which the EU has less able instruments to implement its own, its own uh, decisions, right? Uh, there are new requirements for actorness because there's a new foreign policy agenda, and these new requirements for actorness are harder for the EU to uh, reach. However, we should not expect these processes to have an immediate effect on EU foreign policy or the politics of EU foreign policy for that matter. Structures or structural changes are understood, made sense of and acted upon differently by different actors equipped with different uh, worldviews, right? So we hope to find a diversity of responses to fragmenting liberal international order. And this is precisely the interpretation that we propose for strategic autonomy. We understand strategic autonomy as a cluster of speech acts that respond to the fragmentation of the liberal international order. And, and I, I, I want to be very clear here on the fact that it is a cluster of speech acts. There are a bundle of different projects under the label strategic autonomy. We, we propose here, um, based on, on FIOD and also on, on the three usual dimensions of strategic autonomy, which are decisional, operational, and industrial. So be able to take decisions, be able to um, uh, carry op uh, over operations and have the industrial basis that will allow all that to happen. We, we, we read um, uh, this bundle as, as, as having at least three different uh, projects. Right? The first one is strategic autonomy as responsibility. Right. Strategic autonomy as an autonomy to do something. Right? Um, this only demands the operational side of things, and it is very much compatible with an idea of the EU contributing, being more able to make a fair contribution to the transatlantic alliance. Right? Um, it's uh, the responsibility of taking care of your uh, share of the burden, so to speak. Right? Um, a, second, a second project is strategic autonomy as, as hedging, as hedging your bets. It's an autonomy in case, in case of what in case there, the EU drifts away from, from the Atlantic and into the uh, Pacific, which is something that is expected to happen by many observers and many practitioners um, as well. Here, that would need uh, an operational side but also an industrial side, because you need to be able to provide your, your own capacities for security policies uh, by way of your own industrial base. But probably it doesn't require a deterrent, right? It doesn't require you to develop your own deterrent outside of the US umbrella, because you, can, you are only hedging. Right, you are only it, it's only an insurance policy, so you want to part of hedging is also remaining linked 
to the US, right? And, and of course, this is incompatible with creating your own uh, deterrent for, for, for your security policies. And finally, there's strategic autonomy as emancipation, as full emancipation from the US, but also from other uh, great powers. This implies autonomy from each uh, great power. And, and this, of course, means operational, it means industrial. And here, of course, it's, you also need to be reliable on your own uh, industry basis as opposed to the US, but also uh, as opposed to on tech matters, for instance, as opposed to the Chinese industrial uh, basis. But uh, you, also, uh, you also need to be able to take your own decisions. Here are these three, if you wish, these are three different um, steps in the same ladder um, from a lesser to greater degrees of strategic autonomy by adding each uh, on each on each step, adding a new uh, a new uh, dimension to the strategic autonomy. Of course, these are none of these are binary, binary categories. You can have more or less of each of them, more or less operational autonomy, more or less industrial autonomy. It's not a zero one thing. But nevertheless, it makes sense to think of these three different uh, bundles, right? Okay. Um, probably there is nevertheless a broader diversity of uh, views, of understandings of changes in the liberal international order that will lead to different uh, non-strategic autonomy, if you wish, uh, responses to such to such uh, fragmentation, and and what we try to do, and what we will try to do in in both in this presentation and in the paper that we are writing for Athens, is to provide for a map, uh, a very simple map, to be able to capture a broader uh, a broader uh, diversity of options. There's not only diversity within the strategic autonomy camp; there's diversity elsewhere as well. Uh, we start by differentiating between three broad and long-lasting approaches to EU foreign policy, nationalism, Atlanticism, and Europeanism. The latter two are a key cleavage in the development of EU foreign policies, you know, forever. And, and, and I think that we, that we can claim that it Still, it, they, it still remains very much relevant, that cleavage. It is a key divide between different national strategic cultures in the EU, and it has also bearing on more recent debates for, for sure. Atlanticists and Europeanists think of their countries' participations in international relations as mediated respectively by their belonging to the West and to Europe or, or the EU. In contradistinction, nationalists will rather think of their state as an individual participant in international affairs and encumbered by alignments, commitments, and solidarities imposed by membership in broader blocs. We, we can think of this approach as an expression in, in the foreign policy realm of, of demarcationist uh, or skeptical attitudes as, as described by Kriesi and, and, and many others. Uh, to, to be sure, there are many ways in which you could combine aspects of nationalism and or Europeanism and or Atlanticism into politically cohesive proposals. Uh, therefore, we should expect to find mixed impure uh, expressions of such worldviews, but, but there is value within in keeping them analytically uh, distinct. Uh, we also differentiate between two different reactions to fragmenting liberal international order. Actors can either embrace fragmentation or reject it. Those who embrace it can do so because of a normative preference, because they see it as a promising development, for instance, and or out of the conviction that it is an irreversible trend that one needs to adapt, right? On the contrary, others would rather reject the fragmentation of the liberal international order because of principled or strategic reasons again, or simply because of an inability to change course and, and, and move your own foreign policy somewhere else. The outcome of crossing these two very simple variables is uh, preliminary, admittedly preliminary, two times three table with six different options. Um, I hope it, you can see it or it's not, it's not uh, too, too big. Um, um, I, I don't want to go into too many details here, but the idea is that nationalists who accept the uh, fragmentation of the liberal international order might even embrace it, right? They see 
the future as one of a fragmented order of sovereign nations, right? They are Eurosceptic anyway, so why stop at fragmenting the EU if you can fragment the uh, liberal international order in, in general? And they would probably think of their own foreign policies are as, as a transactional realignment with other great powers uh, not necessarily within the boundaries and parameters of classical EU foreign policy. It is a bit more complicated to reject the fragmentation of the liberal international order and embrace the fragmentation of the EU, right? Nationalists will rather fragment the EU, disintegrate instead of integrate further, right? So it's it's a bit it's 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 a bit squaring the circle here. But nevertheless, we have seen how the UK was able to put together this global greeting discourse, which was basically the idea that you know when you are outside of the slow moving um, machine of EU policy making, you are actually more nimble to make your own contribution to a global order of sovereign nations that is integrated enough, right? Um, this is for sure only available to big players. You need to perceive yourself as, as being able to have your own participation directly in this uh, integrated um, international order, uh, but that's, that's, but that's a, a possible option um, as well, right? The EU does not play a relevant role in any of these two roles under the nationalist uh, uh, column, right? When it comes to Atlanticists, of course, um, the available options depend on whether there is an Atlanticist, an equally Atlanticist uh, US administration or not, or whether you expect that in the future you will be able to count on an Atlanticist US administration or, or not, right? If you are Atlanticist and there is an Atlanticist US administration and you accept the fragmentation of the liberal international order, then you see very much the world in terms of the West against the rest, a united West against, against the rest. And this for sure requires for the EU to be able to make a bigger contribution to the West. And this of course plays into the operational strategic autonomy uh, side of things, right? You need to be autonomous to make a greater contribution, right? Good. It's autonomy as, 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 uh, as responsibility, right? If the US is not Atlanticist, on the other hand, then you see the world as one in which you have the rest against a divided West. And you, you need at least to, you need at least to, to, to be able to hedge your bets, right? Uh, you have the hope of getting the US back probably with the next elections. And we saw this um, we saw this in, in, in the past few years with the Trump administration. So you probably have less of an incentive to develop your own deterrent. Um, but but you, you need to, to be able to develop the, an autonomy in case you, the US drifts away really uh, for, for good. And this demands both an operational and an industrial strategic autonomy. Uh, this is very much what the Commission is is moving towards. At least, at least uh, what the uh, um, High Representative uh, uh, VP is moving towards. This idea of of being able to have uh, this autonomy in case, at least, right? If the hope vanishes, or as the hope vanishes um, of of getting the US back, then probably you have to move to the next column. You have to move to. Um, to the Europeanist uh, uh, approach. If you, on the, on, on the other hand, reject uh, fragmentation, you are an Atlanticist that rejects fragmentation, and you have a US administration that is equally Atlanticist, then, then basically, I probably, this is the most, this is the scenario in which you see less of a break with the past. It's just, a continuity with the past under more difficult conditions, right? Things just got a bit more complicated. Uh, the West is less able to impose its will, but it still has a rather good hand, right? Um, it, it does not impose upon you, it does not impose upon you, you know, much higher requirements for, for, for actorness because you can have confidence in US capacities, right? So this is probably the one that changes the, the, the least. Um, 
you and 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 you, but you you might be open perhaps to to see a bilateral U.S. EU relationship as leverage for the reform and the defense of the liberal international order, right? So you might move from a more classically multilateral to a more uh, bilateral Atlanticist approach to the defense of the liberal international order. Uh, again, this is um, uh, also part of what the EU has, uh, the, sorry, the commission has been saying as regards, as regards uh, multilateralism, for instance, right? Um, if the U.S. is 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 not doesn't have an Atlanticist um, administration, then things get really really complicated in this in this column, right? Um, if you reject the fragmentation of the liberal international order, uh, but you don't have the U.S. as a partner, uh, or you lose the hope of getting back the U.S., then you also need to move to the next column, and you have very little. Um, options uh, uh, left, and, and and I think that this is what Merkel meant when when she said uh, back in I would say that was back in 2017. You know, um, we need to take our fate in our own hands. We cannot expect the U.S. to always be there. Of course, that was uh, 2017, right? And finally, I'm I'm on my finishing minutes here. Um, on, on the third column, on the Europeanist approach, uh, if you accept that there's a fragmenting liberal international order, you are probably prone to see the world as one of competing regional blocs. Right? And this means that you need full-fledged operational, industrial, and decisional strategic in autonomy that might require that might require developing your own deterrent, right? Taking your own fate in your own hands, as it as it as it as it were, right? You need autonomy from. You need autonomy as emancipation, right? Um, because that's what the competing uh, world of competing regional blocks in which you cannot trust the U.S. or you don't want to trust the U.S. Um, demands from you. If you, on the other hand, reject. The fragmentation of the liberal international order, then perhaps you are you are prone to see the EU as a weaver of this liberal international order, right? As developing multiple alliances, uh, not only Atlantic, you know, transatlantic alliances, but multiple alliances, um, non-prejudiced uh, alliances with multiple actors here and there, depending on how preferences combine and converge. To defend the to defend the liberal international order or a rules based order here and there on different policy um, domains, um, probably this also demands some sort of operational, industrial, and decisional autonomy. But um, because the order is here perceived as less conflictual or as not necessarily moving, because you are rejecting to see that as the uh, unavoidable outcome, uh, because the, you, you don't see the order as, as so conflictual as you might see it on the um, upper um, row of that same column, because you reject to see that as an avoidable uh, outcome, then perhaps you don't need, probably you don't need uh, uh, your own deterrent, right, which, which allows you to keep more of a status quo or think uh, uh, when, when dealing with the, with the U.S. Um, now, there is a way in which different worldviews would lead to different responses to the fragmentation of the liberal international order. There's also a way in which your readiness to embrace each of these different responses might put you in one of these columns, right? And force you to rationalize one particular worldview, to engineer back a particular worldview because of what you are ready to accept, what you are ready to do, what kind of uh, steps forward you're ready to take in terms of in terms of strategic autonomy. Okay, just my final remark. This is my last uh, slide. So we should not be super surprised, right? Over history, different kinds of agents have risen and fallen and have been 
selected or out selected because of their inability to match the, regard, the requirements imposed by the international order. Right? States were just the you know one of them, right? Uh, and many other appeared and, and disappeared. So we we should not be surprised that change a changing a deeply changing international order just makes some actors more or re less relevant or makes or pushes them into um, becoming something else, right? So actorness is also externally determined. If, 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 if I, I want to speak, you know, our own EU studies or IR jargon, right? Uh, put another way, failing forward does not happen because I'm, 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 I'm in a way intrigued by the way in which this explanation, this, this, this narrative intersects the failing forward uh, idea, right? Failing forward does not happen in a constant milieu, right? In which the EU lives in a laboratory-like uh, environment. But it happens while conditions worsen for the EU internationally, right? And, and hence there's this raising bar of what an optimal intergovernmental agreement would look like, would imply, right? What we think is optimal today is different from what will become optimal in a few years. What we needed a few years ago is different from what we need today in the midst of a probably long war in Ukraine um, that is very much framed in terms of, you know, uh, a Ukraine that wants to look to the EU or a Ukraine that wants, that would be forced or would be led to look uh, eastwards away from the EU, right? Um, so there's this sort of internationally embedded, an extreme way of failing forward, uh, not falling, but failing forward. Um, failing forward because it, it, it always become, it, it's this chasing, it's this chasing the goalposts that are moving uh, always farther, farther uh, away. Strategic autonomy refers to a cluster of responses to that situation. Uh, and, this, and this cluster needs to be unpacked and, and, and we try to do that and to connect um, uh, different um, aspects of strategic autonomy with different worldviews. But when you do that, then you can enlarge the map of possible responses to the fragmentation of the liberal international order, even beyond, uh, beyond the scope of, of the discourse on, 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 on strategic autonomy. Okay, so that's all on, on my side. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ariel, for this really big food for thought, I would like to ask you for our students who are listening, could you please explain to them, because I know they don't know what a Kindleberger crisis is, that's small, uh, please, because I'm sure they got lost at that point. Um, but then what really interested me, because that's fascinating, your table and um, I would like to know, because now you go on in your research, in that uh, new project, and um, what are you doing now? What are you doing now, method-wise? I mean, how you're? Do you try now to to identify in which part of the table you will uh, locate an actor and or have a map like this, or what? What is your next step now in research after you develop that that table already? Maybe we start with this. On the. Kindleberger uh, crisis. If you if you want me to get there, um, there are a number of different ways to think about the crisis of the liberal international order. Uh, they can be seen as competing ways or as complementary ways, and for sure, different schools of thought would put their emphasis in one or the other. Um, there is one way to look at that that basically says, you know, this is big enough to be thinking about. Um, a challenge to peace, great power competition is supposed to become really um, a challenge to peace between great powers, not only peace, but peace between great powers. And there's the risk of great power, uh, 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 great power uh, confrontation. And this harks back to, to Thesis, right? Harks back to this idea that when you have these uh, hegemonic transitions, to when you have changes at the higher level of the international structure in terms of distribution of power, then there is a high risk 
Dutia said, you know, it's inevitable, but you don't need to take him at, at, at face value. But, you know, there's high risk of uh, clash, uh, armed clash, you know, war between great powers. And this would be the Tutidis crisis. Another take would, would say, you know, this is a Kindleberger crisis, which has to do with the fact that you are losing uh, the hegemon. You are losing, uh, the, the system is losing the hegemon. The system does, uh, lacks, uh, lacks um, an actor which is able and willing to either impose cooperation on others or pay for cooperation itself, pay for the provision, afford for the provision of public goods, right? And of course, this harks back to Charles Kindleberger, who in the 1970s made, um, uh, wrote, wrote this book on, on, on the interwar years economic crisis and basically claimed, you know, the UK was not able anymore to lead cooperation in response to the economic crisis. And the US might have been able, but was not willing to do so. Didn't have the kind of uh, mindset, mindset that would have allowed the, the US to do so, right? So here you would have a situation in which by lacking an hegemon by lacking the leader, if you wish, uh, cooperation fails. Cooperation fails because nobody is strong enough to impose cooperation on others, right? That this goes back to the hegemonic theory, uh, hegemonic stability theory, right? There's a third way to look into this. I have not included that in, 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 the, um, in the slides, but anyway, which would say, you know, th 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 this is actually a Polanyi crisis, if if I if I if I if I may, right? Um, this is built on top of political and social conditions created by the disembedding of the liberal international order, right? And this is what explains Trump. This is what explains uh, the populist uh, uh, wave, and, and and so on and so forth. Right? Let's not go there, perhaps. But that's another. That's another. Uh, male denominated, male author denominated uh, uh, crisis, right? So we would have to see this Kindleberger and, and Polanyi, if you, if you wish. Now, methods wise, uh, we don't know yet. I'm, I'm, this is the first time I present this table. So uh, uh, I, I, I first need to know whether this table makes any sense to anybody else outside of our own heads. Maybe, right? maybe you also tell us how did you come up with that table? I mean, this is always hard to set up such a table. Oh? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I we, we had like super, for a long time, we had double thoughts. Um, particularly before the Ukraine crisis, on whether we should seek to this Europeanist Atlanticist uh, take. Uh, what, if the, what if the crisis is also a crisis of the ways in which we talk about these things, right? What if, what if we need different concepts to understand uh, the situation here? And, and the crisis is also an ontological one of, of, or an epistemological one, if you wish, of, of not being able to use the old categories to understand the new situation. But then you know what, if some, we have seen something during these months is that this is yet a really big deal, right? That if you want to understand Scholz and Macron and the difficulties they are having with Poland and the Baltics, you need to understand the different takes they have, you know, it, it, it really resonates with this old Europe, new Europe, you know, uh, mm. early 2000s thing of, of, of whether you think of yourself as, you know, how much you need the US deterrent and, and you know, and, and whether you think of the way to deal with your threats as being more in line with trying to have good, you know, being good terms with your threats, so to speak, or being in good terms with your, with your, uh, the guy providing you with security guarantees, right? It, it's in a way, I, I, I'm not, you know, most of the audience here, I, I guess, is uh, German, so I, I don't want to, I don't want to look more German than you are, but in, in a way, in a way, we are back to Adenauer versus Willy Brandt, if you wish, CDU, SPD, right? You, you attach yourself to the old CDU, you attach yourself um, to the US as, as closely as possible 
or you try to develop some sort of, you know, Ostpolitik that also has uh, uh, some place for, for of course, talking about um, borders and human rights, but also tries to change through trade. And, and you still, despite the site and bender, you, you still see that structure of thought very much ingrained and entrenched in in divisions in so we we thought that perhaps keeping the distinction between atlanticists and europeanists made sense and it also it also dovetails the divide between different kinds of of strategic autonomy projects right um now how do we expect this to happen we would love to see actors moving from one cell to the next so we don't expect to, we would not want, I mean, we at least do not start from the premise of an essentialization of, you know, France is always here, you know, Poland is always here. Uh, we, we expect this to be a bit more fluid and to change, for, for instance, depending on who is sitting on the White House, right? Um, which I think introduces a lot of movement in the table and, and there's already in the table places in which we say, you know, this, this, you know, move, move, move to the next, move to the next cell, right? <laughs> so uh, so it, yeah. it already introduces some sort of dynamism uh, there, but of course there might be other, other stuff going on. Um, I was, can I just jump in there? Because um, you said, you know, for the Atlanticists, it, it makes a big difference who's sitting yes. in the White House, um, but, or in the administration you put here, but, wouldn't it be wise to have this kind of distinction, distinction also in the Europeanists? I mean, they can at that the way you did it now, they can move towards the other cell, but maybe they can also move back. I mean, you know, yes. doesn't it make also a sense to really have this distinct? I mean, that makes the table three dimensional, which is really hard, but. Wouldn't that make also a difference? Because here you have this distinction only in the Atlanticists' column, so to speak. But isn't that also a difference for the Europeanists? That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, that's a really good point. That's but the nationalists, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that, but yes. maybe. I mean, it's always hard if you have another layer therein, but you yes. introduce that layer in one column. And yes. the question is, because because you said uh, move forward, but maybe at one point in the Europeanist you said move backwards. You know. Yes. Yes. That's that's a, that's 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 really a good point. And also, it 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 should it would capture the situation in which the risk of falling into a trap in which the EU is moving or a big block of EU countries is moving from one column to the other every four years, right? Or every, you know, or depending on the midterms, we are moving this way or the other way. And it, it would, that's a good point. That's that's the reason why I I, I I said, you know, this is the first time I want to present yeah, this table, well, right? It's, it's, I'm, I'm happy it's, to have this kind of stages. So also for the students, it's nice to see that also we are developing and learning yes, and, and yes. changing, yeah. yeah. I, 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 that, that's a really good point. I, 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 I need to see how, we operationalize that in terms yeah. of, but it's 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 really good point, and it should not be so difficult to introduce here. I think should, so. I think it so. should okay. not. It should not. Uh, yes, uh, sure. And uh, you just said, okay, maybe there's Poland and all the, I mean, all the member states, and maybe they're moving. Maybe they're moving during the war. Who knows? You know. But yeah. also maybe they are moving because midterms uh, and yeah. the next elections are coming, depending on how long that war will go on. Unfortunately. Uh, they are coming. Um, but are there other actors? I mean, do you look member states wise or do you also look at, I mean, like what is Borrell's uh, yes. place in that table on von der Leyen and so on? That's, that's you know, you. I, I, I don't want to go into the dirty part of how research is organized, but you need to understand how uh, what what the Spanish research group is, which is basically what we are with this project. We have basically national money, mm. and it's very little money to organize mm. conferences and to go to places and to pay membership fees and <laughs> registrations and 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 things like that. 
They don't and, have researchers and, who do that work, no? And we will have one uh, pre-doc. Uh, which means that at the end of the day, this is very much a bottom-up exercise uh, in which you need to propose a framework in which people can frame not moving their research agenda so far away from what they are already doing. They can frame and they, they can develop what, you know, their own research into a new way. Oh. And so what kind of empirics we will have depends very much on, not on research design, but on, I don't know, you know, this sort of, <laughs> yes, orchestration. I, I, I guess that's the, that's, that's, that's a, a very one. diplomatic way. <laughs> yes, yes. Or perhaps, perhaps uh, you can always make a call and then, and then try to look for more organized yeah. papers and, and, and so on from different institutions. That's something that we also do. But then, okay. then, there's, then this comes farther down the road. Um, so let me reframe the question. So if you would have uh, a million euro, what would you do with that table? <laughs> I would try to look for not only states, but also transnational schools of thought. Okay. Mm. I, 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 I would like to know whether not Germany is debating with France or with Poland, but whether you know, there are, at least in some countries, different approaches that are not, nas not necessarily, but I, I would try to avoid the reification of national perspectives and, mm -hmm. and see whether within the, the EU parliament, for this, mm -hmm. the European parliament, within uh, the commission, within, you know, whether you, you find different trends, different camps, different blocks that are not exclusively national in making, at least, Mm. That's a question I would ask, whether, whether there are mm. uh, transnational schools of thought on how to react to the liberal international order. And this would lead me to contestation, which is, which mm. is uh, also a, a topic that, 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 you know, we've been yeah. looking at. Mm. Well, uh, and also maybe because different, it's a, it might be a different if you look at the, at the European Council or the Council of Foreign Relations. Oh? Yes, because yes. That's, it might that's also a good, be a different. Yes. Yes. at least uh, in some of the countries yes yes for sure well, yeah well very fascinating uh, and i wish you would have that million and uh, we could have a great great outcome but i'm sure there's a great outcome even without a million euro so um so i was dominating i'm very sorry um but i'm so fascinated and really looking forward what's coming out there so is there any other question because for the students, that might be hard stuff now, and maybe they're a bit timid today. Is there any other questions? Also, we have guests here. Please go ahead. Okay, then let me one ask one last question because yes, you said, sure, um, sure. you said um, the strategic autonomy leads to a cluster of responses or two clusters of responses uh, which have to be unpacked. Yes. Um, can you give us a hint uh, which clusters you think might be out there and just well, that's, that's a precise, little bit on that thought? That's precisely, I, 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 I might not have been clear enough here. That's precisely what we try to do while, while looking at um, strategic autonomy as responsibility, mm -hmm. which is this, um, and, and pardon my German, this fascist kite uh german word which is capacity to do something it's it's mm -hmm. the capacity to act more than the capacity to 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 decide right oh, okay. and, and 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 i guess that's why the germans are more again the germans really very fine uh, national perspectives you know what i mean uh, that's probably why a more atlanticist country as germany than france is closer to this to this to these uh to these um uh, uh, term than than to European sovereignty, for instance, or you know strategic autonomy uh, in in general, right? So there's this idea of strategic autonomy as uh, responsibility, as being able to have a, a bigger a bigger share of the burden. Um, then there's the idea of hedging, the idea of an insurance policy um, that means that you will diversify your alliances, uh, not breaking the alliance with the US. There's this uh, cord that links you with the US, 
which is a, a, a deterrent, security deterrent, but you diversify your alliances not to be so dependent, just in case, right? Um, in a way, it's it's a Japanization, if if I if if I may, <laughs> of of EU foreign policy. Okay. Um, um, uh, and that implies probably also a, a bigger um, industrial autonomy. It's not only oh. it's it's by together, and this by means by military kit sometimes, right? On many occasions, it's by together, by more, by European, and this is what Borrelli say, right? Precisely these three uh, verbs: by together, these three sentences: by together buy more, buy European. Uh, and then of course, there's the project of full emancipation, right? Uh, or something short, you know, short of full, but you know, more in that direction in which okay. you, you see yourself as an independent player. If you think that the US is nevertheless going to be concerned about China and uh, you need to take care of yourself. And, and, and of course, this, this might mean that you arm to your teeth to be able to uh, resist Russia, or that you try and, and, and be good friends with Russia in some sort of European common house or uh, European com political uh, community that is in good terms with, with Russia at least after the war, right? Uh, and, and which, which seems to be in a way the Macron project. So there, there are different ways in which you, you, can, you can go um, about that. That's the way we unpack it. Mm -hmm. We might be losing okay. something there. Yeah, then I understood. Okay, super. Well, Ariel, we are one hour later. Thank you very much. Thank for you. For that input, that was great. And uh, put that, slogan strategic autonomy in a very uh, good scientific corset and make it we'll see. Bit, or or uh, um, a scientific um, order or make it more you can grab it now because it's such yes. a fluid yeah you say it and you say strategic yeah. serenity you say autonomy and nobody knows what uh, whoever used that word means so that was very systematic that was bringing us to a point where we could understand what can be meant by it and where people might stand. Um, thanks a lot. This is Thank really, you. was really great. Thanks for having you here. And for my students, they might stay for a minute because exams are approaching. Oh, <laughs> good luck everybody with the exams. <laughs> thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you very See much you. for bye having bye. me. Bye-bye. See you.